Hi there. I'm Jim Zirin. Welcome back for more Conversations. With us is Bob Piggott. Bob Piggott is a top-notch New York lawyer with an eye for history. His focus has been on the dozens of buildings and structures that represent our city's rich legal heritage, ranging from the Beaux-Arts Surrogates Court Building on Chambers Street, built in 1907, to the old federal courthouse on Montague Street in Brooklyn Heights, where the Eastern District of New York first found a home in 1867. His illustrated book, New York's Legal Landmarks, has become a classic. More recently, he's turned his attention to some of New York's legal lions, the all but forgotten lawyer statesmen who earned a special place on the national scene. I'm pleased to welcome Bob Piggott back to the program. Well, Bob, um, I picked up this uh, periodical of legal history uh, known as uh, Judicial Notice, and there was your article on William M. Everts, a lion of the New York bar. Uh, how did you come to be interested in uh, William M. Everts? What I like about this story is that it starts with a mystery, not on the order of Charles Foster Kane and Rosebud, but something sort of in the same vein. Over 40 years ago, I went to high school near 2nd Avenue and 14th Street, and I distinctly remember walking by this tenement that had chiseled over the doorway the words U.S. Senate, and that really puzzled me. Um, the U.S. Senate once did convene in New York City in 1789 and 1790, during that brief year when New York was the capital of the United States, but that was down on Wall Street, and at that time, 2nd Avenue and 14th Street was farmland. Uh, what I didn't notice was that the next tenement over had the words W.M. Everts uh, chiseled over the doorway. And that really is the clue to why these tenements uh, were so named. This fellow Everts, William Maxwell Everts, was a U.S. Senate senator in the late, in the late 19th century. Did he live in, in one of the two tenements? Well, he didn't live in one of the two tenements. He had a really grand mansion on the site of the two tenants. He was there from about 1850 to 1900, at a time when Second Avenue was still a, a fashionable place where a very successful lawyer might live. But after his death, the tenements were, t the, his mansion was torn down, and the two tenements were built. And to remember him, those two, names, U.S. Senate and W.M. Everts, were carved in the two doorways. So that's the connection. But as I started... Okay, so you got interested in the man because of uh, two buildings and uh, his name on one of the two buildings. Now, tell us about the man. What, what did you find out about him? Well, this is really extraordinary because this man, William Maxwell Everts, is completely forgotten. There isn't a, a park or a statue or a high school name for him, but he was the most successful lawyer of his era in New York City, but also a phenomenal statesman. He was, he was U.S. Attorney General. He was U.S. Secretary of State. He uh, was a U.S. Senator from New York for six years. He represented Andrew Johnson in the impeachment trial in the U.S. Senate against Johnson in 1868. He was uh, Rutherford B. Hayes' counsel in the disputed election proceedings. Well, Johnson was acquitted, and he promptly appointed Everts as his attorney general. That actually was a career pattern for mm -hmm. Everts. He represented Johnson, and Johnson appointed him to a cabinet. He represented Rutherford B. Hayes, and Rutherford B. Rutherford B. Hayes appointed him to his cabinet. Made him secretary of state. That's right. He's so, nothing like being a successful lawyer. Yeah. And, you know, and, or having a grateful client who happens to be the President of the United States. And this was in addition to a tremendously successful legal career. He really was the preeminent lawyer of, of, his, of his era. So talk about his career at the bar a little bit. Well, he came to New York after graduating from Harvard Law School in 1840, went to work for a well-established lawyer, but after only one year, struck out on his own and very quickly uh, began building up a very impressive practice. In, in 1860, he, uh, he um, litigated a case that was very similar to the Dred Scott case. It was called the Lemon Slave Case, although the result was different. There, it was found that a slave, by virtue of being brought to New York State, even if only in transit, gained his freedom. Well, the Dred Scott case was 1857, and uh, there they uh, held just the opposite. They said, uh, actually, it was a, a disgraceful opinion, a dark day in the history of the court, because they uh, held that uh, African-American people were not citizens of the United States. So, uh, therefore, they didn't lose their status as slaves, even though they went into a free state. Uh, Everts was involved in the 1860 case, the Lemon Slave case, uh, which uh, achieved the opposite result in New York State. 
There, it may have depended on the fact that Dred Scott was brought into a territory which implicated uh, federal legislation uh, governing the, the right to own slaves in the territories, whereas Lemon had been brought into a, an existing state of the Union, New York State. Well, I think uh, it was Charles Evans Hughes who said that Dred Scott was uh, the greatest self-inflicted wound uh, that the Supreme Court ever dealt itself. He was another great jurist who also had a very rich New York City life as a lawyer. Well, perhaps we can get to him. <laughs> so, all right, so he had the Lemon Slave case, and what, was, what were his other notable cases? Well, I think the one which, for which he might be best known is his defense of Henry Board, Ward Beecher in a case bought, brought by a friend of his, Theodore Tilton, for criminal conversation and alienation of affections. Okay, now a lot of people out there don't know what criminal conversation is, so maybe you can uh, give us an insight into criminal conversation. Well, these are causes causes of action that don't exist anymore, thankfully. They've been abolished by statute. So That's right. Alienation of affections, breach of promise to marry, criminal conversation. So tell us what they are. Well, uh, Theodore Tilton had been a, first of all, Henry Ward Beecher was perhaps the most famous man uh, of the time. He was the brother of Harriet Beecher Stowe, who wrote Uncle Tom's Cabin. He was an abolitionist. He was an abolitionist. He was the preacher at the Plymouth Congregation in Brooklyn Heights. And he was so popular that people, at that point in time, Brooklyn was a separate city. It wasn't part of New York, which then was pretty much just Manhattan. Oh, it's not a separate city today? Well, some might think it, some might think it is. But he was so popular that there were Beecher boats, people coming over from Manhattan to Brooklyn to hear him preach. And, and he preached against free love, didn't he? He was very moralistic. That, that, that's true. So that, that's what makes this case all the more uh, uh, poignant. Uh, a sex case. A sex. This, it, this is a sex case. Come no, on. Reed, this is, this is a CUNY TV. We can say a sex <laughs> case. Uh, and Tilton was his friend. And uh, it, it, it seems and clear. Tilton had a beautiful wife. Had a beautiful wife, Elizabeth. And it seems clear that uh, Beecher had an affair with Tilton's wife. And initially, it seemed like they patched things up, but gradually Tilton felt compelled to talk about it. And ultimately, after Beecher was cleared by the church, Tilton brought his suit in Brooklyn City Court, uh, which at the time was located in the, in the county courthouse on Jermaliman Street, a wonderful building. Uh, and, now it's the site of Brooklyn Law, so law and School. The suit was for criminal conversation, that's adultery. Right. What we might call adultery, and, right. and also alienation of affections. That's right. And um, so, so uh, Beecher retained Everts, who was the preeminent litigator of, of his era. And it was a six month trial in Brooklyn in 1875. Uh, ultimately, it was a hung jury. The jury deliberated for, I think, eight days. They had dozens and dozens of votes. The votes varied from 11 to 1 for no liability to 7 to 5. Ultimately, it was 9 to 3. So it was nine, a hung... 9 to 3 for liability. For no liability. For no liability. It was a hung jury. Beecher got off. Was it a vindication? I think most people probably believe that he had, in fact, uh, had an affair with uh, Tilton's wife, but he had been cleared. At least he hadn't been found liable. So he was not cleared in the court of public opinion. He was just cleared in, in the court of law. That, that's correct. Now, he wasn't really clear. There was a, a jury disagreement. There might have been another trial, but there never was. Uh, so uh, what did Everett's uh, contribute to uh, this whole thing? You know, there was uh, 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 much reason to believe that, um, uh, that he was, uh, Stowe, uh, Beecher was guilty because uh, uh, the wife, Tilton's wife, confessed it to none, no, none other than uh, Elizabeth Cady Stanton and uh, who in turn uh, told another uh, suffragette feminist, uh, uh, Mrs. Woodhill, who was uh, at, completely at odds with Everett's. Right, who was also... Uh, and, and at odds with, uh, with Beecher. And she was an advocate of free love, yeah. and she was a great and good friend of Cornelius Vanderbilt, uh, who took... Uh, uh, her under his wing. She was actually the first uh, woman to run for president of the United States, mm. and she had a brokerage house. Really, a very unusual woman for her era. Right. So, two women knew the secret, but neither one could testify about it. Now, tell about that. Well, I think, you know, that, that's uh, at, at that point, when it was clear that Mrs. Tilton wasn't going to testify, the question was whether. Well, why didn't Mrs. Tilton testify? Well, it's because of spousal immunity. Uh, and, um, and Mr. Tilton. What is what's spousal immunity? It's the yeah. right of one spouse to prevent the other spouse from testifying to preserve the sanctity of the marital relationship. Okay, so Tilton brought the suit, but he couldn't call his wife and ask her whether she'd had an affair with Beach. Right. But then the question was, when Everett's was cross-examining Tilton, is it fair to allow Tilton to testify, given that his wife had not been allowed to testify? And ultimately, the result was that Tilton was put on, 
Everett's crossed examined him, but Tilton could not go into any confidential communications he had with his wife. Like, uh, did you have an affair with Beecher? Yes, I did. He couldn't go into that. Something like that, yeah. Uh, but he was asked, uh, uh, Everett's was kind of clever in his cross-examination. It was later considered to be a masterpiece by legal scholars because uh, he asked him whether uh, he'd noticed any change in uh, the relationship uh, as she became friendly or unfriendlier with Beecher, and he said no. That, that was that, pretty damaging. That was very case. damaging. So, and interestingly, on the other side, the cross-examination was also viewed as just a textbook case of brilliant cross-examination. Tilton's, uh, Tilton's lawyer, Fullerton, cross-examined Beecher very effectively. And uh, so you had this inconclusive result in court, uh, and uh, it was all left for the, the court of public opinion. That's right. So what other cases did uh, Everett's have? Well, I, I, the, the representation of Johnson is, is, is a singular case. And recently I was uh, flipping the channels and I came upon a movie which is a biopic of Andrew Johnson with Van Heflin as Andrew Johnson in the 1940s. And I thought, great, I'll finally get to see Everett's on the screen. But of course, you know, golden age of Hollywood simplification, he's not in the movie at all. In fact, Johnson himself delivers the closing argument that in fact Everett's delivered before the U.S. Senate. He he uh, summed up for uh, uh, many days. Many days. It's hard to imagine that. The f he, he, that's what he was most in, uh, brilliant at. It was uh, summing up for long periods of time. It was eight days in the in the Tilton case, and the, the I don't know how many days in the Johnson case, which was one of uh, America's two uh, impeachment trials, both of which uh, ended in acquittal. The few summations I've done, I've barely been able to pad out to more than an hour. And here he is on the... Well, and also you have a judge who says uh, uh, you're going to be limited to an hour, counsel, or half hour or worse. Um, so any other cases that were uh, notable? Uh, you know, he, he combined a federal practice with, 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 with a state law practice. He was also a leading figure in New York City. Uh, I, I, I was bicycling through Central Park the other day past Cleopatra's Needle. He was, he was the speaker at, when that, that was unveiled. Speaker at the Statue of Liberty. Statue, he was an instrumental in raising funds to build the pedestal, and he spoke there, also at the 7th Regiment Armory. He was the first... That's the one on Park Avenue. Correct. He was the first president of the Bar Association of the City of New York and held that role longer for any, anyone else, nearly 10 years. Just a remarkable figure, and that's why I think it's so incredible he's completely forgotten. The only time his name still comes up is with respect to something called the Everts Act, which... Because uh, he was the United States Senator. He was the United States Senator. So we're he, back to that building you saw when you were in high school. Right. So he, when he was in the U.S. Senate, he was the sponsor of a bill that greatly changed the federal court system and uh, gave it the structure we currently know. Before that, there had been this unusual court between the district court and the U.S. Supreme Court called, called, called the circuit court, and that was essentially abolished by the Everts Act. And uh, that created what was then known as the Circuit Courts of Appeal and uh, now known as the United States Courts of Appeal. And it did away with a very unusual phenomenon, and that was the responsibility that Supreme Court justices had previously had of riding the circuit, traveling, to, traveling around with a district court judge to try cases. Uh, it was quite a burden on the, on, on the Supreme Court justices, and of course they were very pleased to be relieved of that. Okay, so you mentioned another legal lion at the New York Bar, uh, Charles Evans Hughes. So tell us something about Charles Evans Hughes. He was famous for saying, as Secretary of State, defended the Japanese, that the only way to disarm is to disarm. <laughs> and uh, it's not a notable quote, but he said it. So tell us more about him. Well, like Everts, Hughes was not a native New Yorker. He was born in upstate New York. His father was a preacher. Uh, he, he, ca he, came to, he came to New York and... Uh, uh, went to the firm that became Hughes, Hubbard, and Reed, uh, married the boss's daughter, uh, the leading partner's daughter. But actually, after a few years, uh, the pressure of practice got to him, and he quit to become a law professor at Cornell and did that for a year or two. But then he returned, and he gained a reputation as a, a brilliant litigator. He was tapped to do some investigations of a couple of corrupt industries, the gas industry being one of them. And that led to his being elected governor of the state of New York. And then, uh, on the strength of that, he was appointed as an associate justice of the U.S. Supreme Court. And that's actually something that's very different from today. Today, when you have, today, all of the nominees that I can recall in recent years have a long, long careers as jurists. They weren't polit political figures like Earl Warren or, uh, or, or, or Hughes, who had been, both of whom had been governors. Well, you have Elena Kagan, who uh, uh, 
uh, was not a jurist, had no prior judicial experience, and you had Clarence Thomas, who had very limited judicial experience. But they hadn't held yeah. elected office. Yes. They weren't politici rough and tumble politicians. Uh, so um, Hughes, Hughes was uh, appointed to the Supreme Court. And then I find this incredible. In 1916, you know, now we know that people start campaigning two years before an election uh, for the president, and sort of just a Shortly before the Republican convention, he was tapped as the Republican nominee. He didn't campaign at all. He accepted it, and he very nearly beat Woodrow Wilson, who was running for a second term. Let's move on to uh, another line of the bar, Ella Hugh Root. Uh, and uh, it's interesting that Ella Hugh Root uh, made the statement that being a lawyer uh, was the only office I ever cared about. Yep, and this uh, is even though he'd held uh, high uh, national office as well. So tell us about Root. Well, Root, uh, <laughs> Root came to New York from uh, Clinton, New York. His father was a professor at Hamilton College. Root went there and was valedictorian. He came to New York, went to NYU Law School, and began practicing law. And one thing that's interesting is that both Everts and Root and Hughes all got their starts as litigators. However, by the late 19th century, lawyers were sort of transitioning and the and they were taking on a role as uh, transactional lawyers, advisors, as well as litigators. So Everts really didn't... Counselors rather than advocates. That, that's right. So, th so that's, uh, th that was a role that Root played. Um, and he was appointed Secretary, Secretary of, of War uh, by, by McKinley. And then uh, when, when Roosevelt became president upon McKinley's assassination, uh, Roosevelt appointed him Secretary of State. He also won the Nobel Peace Prize for its efforts to promote international arbitration. Wasn't he uh, one of the authors, if not the principal author, of the open door policy toward China? That's right. He and John Hay. That's correct. No. Hay started it and Root continued it. Uh, and he was also he was a United States senator, wasn't he? That's right. One thing to remember about this is at that time, until I think it was 1917, the U.S. Senate was not an elected position, popularly elected position. It was position. no direct election of senators. It was uh, part of the, the, the genius of the framers to filter the, uh, the government from the people. Uh, you have it the Electoral College and then also in the United States Senate, which was owned by the, uh, the state legislatures. So Everett's Root, they never ran for public, uh, ran for office in a general election. Uh, now, uh, as a uh, senator, he was one of the, the major supporters of the League of Nations, which of course failed, but uh, uh, he certainly was very internationalist in his mindset. That actually, the failure of the League of Nations reminds me of sort of an uh, the appearance of another New York lawyer, and I'm thinking of Woodrow Wilson. A lot of people remember him as having been uh, the president of Princeton University before he was governor of New Jersey and then elected president. But he very briefly practiced law in Virginia. He had a law degree. And after his presidency, when he was devastated by the, <laughs> the failure of the League of Nations, he was beset with tremendous physical problems, having suffered a very serious stroke. There was a question of how he would support himself. And uh, his, his, a member of his cabinet, Colby, who was a New York City lawyer, got into his head to start a law firm with Wilson. And they created the firm of Wilson and Colby. And if you are to open a volume of Martindale Hubble, which is the directory for lawyers, and in 1920, you will find this firm, Wilson and Colby, which might suggest that Woodrow Wilson was yet another uh, New York City lawyer who had a, a great role in, in government and politics. However, the truth is that Wilson was in such ill health that he never left Washington. He went once or twice to their DC office, never set foot in their Nassau Street office. So this uh, Wilson and Colby was really more of a phantom law firm. So let's discuss another New York lawyer, uh, Franklin Delano Roosevelt. What can you tell us about him that we don't know already? Well, he had two stints as a lawyer, one right out, one right out of Columbia Law School when he was a young man. And this I find funny. If you, are to, if you were to go to the library of the law firm Carter Ledger on Wall Street, they have framed on the wall the offer letter that they made to FDR in 1906. And what I find so funny about it, and only someone with... Uh, uh, FDR's patrician background could probably accept these terms. Mm -hmm. There is an offer that says, of course, you, first of all, it gives him a very generous time to start. I don't think, I think he didn't have to start till late September or October. But there's, a, there's, a, there's the statement, of course, you understand that in the first year, we can't possibly pay you anything. And if you were to stay a second year, while you might get paid, it will necessarily be a very small amount. Uh, now, uh, that letter was signed by uh, a lawyer named, a uh, partner in the firm named Edmund L. Bayless. Uh, do we know anything about him? I actually never had occasion to look, look into his Bayless all that much. He's not 
quite so well known as Franklin Delano Roosevelt. I think that's right. But Roosevelt, of course, had a greater gift for politics than the law. I don't think he was ever, I don't think he ever really committed himself to the law. And uh, very right. shortly after that, he ran for the Senate in Dutchess County, where his family had their country home and was elected. The state Senate. Right, the state Senate. So I think it was Oliver Wendell Holmes who said that Roosevelt had a, a second-rate uh, intellect, but a first-rate temperament. Right, but it was, it was, he was a brilliant politician, and he was appointed Secretary of the Navy. He was a candidate for vice president in 1920, and then, of course, he suffered his stroke. I think his mother only approved of his foray into politics when uh, he took her to see a ship when he was Secretary of the Navy. I think the ship had been named after her. <laughs> <laughs> his mother also gave uh, Franklin Eleanor a, 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 a townhouse in the East 60s, but Eleanor wasn't too thrilled when she realized that the mother kept the adjacent townhouse with a connecting door. Well, uh, <laughs> no free lunches, always strings attached. So, uh, uh, Bill Clinton had said of Franklin uh, Delano Roosevelt that he made public service fun again. Uh, you think that's a fair statement? It is. Even today when you see old newsreels with uh, FDR uh, addressing the public or you hear some of his old fireside chats, there's just a naturalness and a humor that you, I've never heard in any president before, before that. And uh, a certain optimism as well. Which was so necessary at the time, of yes. course. Now, uh, Benjamin Cardozo, there's an interesting story. Uh, he was the judge of judges. He was uh, a judicial giant. Uh, what can you tell us about him? He came from New York, too. He came from New York, and he, lived in, you know, he really lived in New York City his entire life, except when he was appointed to the Supreme Court towards the end of his life. But, uh, you know, we remember him from first-year law school, Paul's graph, McPherson, these great tort law decisions he handed down when he was on the New York Court of Appeals, ultimately as chief judge. He was a great judicial writer. I mean, that, that's why Paul's graph and McPherson versus Buick, in which he decided in the Court of Appeals, that's why they live on. And uh, uh, I remember uh, uh, the, uh, he had said of the... Uh, uh, the suit of, uh, for unjust enrichment, he said it was a suit whereby the conscience of uh, the chancellor uh, uh, obtains expression. I mean, he had just a marvelous way of, uh, uh, of writing and a marvelous judicial style and the many, many examples, probably even better than right. uh, the assault on the citadel of privity proceeds in this day of pace. Or that description uh, of fiduciary duty in the Ultramaris case, the punctilio of honor. Yes, that, uh, that's, that's right. I thought there's in Meinhard v. Salmon. Was, yeah, that's right. In Meinhard v. Salmon. Uh, but, uh, but anyway, what's in interesting fact, there, Tell us about his yeah. background. So there, what's interesting, it, it seems that what may have driven him was a desire to overcome the disgrace that his father had experienced. His father was a Supreme Court justice and part of the Tammany, uh, Tammany uh, Hall machine. And uh, when, uh, when, when everyone was closing in on, on Boss Tweed, uh, the father, Albert Cardozo, also resigned in disgrace. He was not disbarred. He was able to preserve his law license, and that allowed him to sort of re rebuild his, his professional life and his family life. So while briefly the family moved to a, a house in the West 40s, a very unfashionable part of town, ultimately, and the building is still standing, they bought a townhouse on Madison and 68th. You can see it now, although the first floor is uh, it's actually a store with for ladies unmentionables, a very fancy store, but that's where Cardozo grew up. And one thing that's sort of funny is that his, uh, his tutor when he was growing up was Horatio Alger. His was not a rags to riches story really, but he, uh, his tutor was Horatio Alger who wrote all those rags to riches stories. Do you feel that he was motivated, uh, in, for at least from your study of his life, either in whole or in part, uh, from uh, by his father's disgrace. That's that seems pretty clear that he committed his life to you know, a life of absolute rectitude and probity to overcome uh, the the disgrace of his father's resignation from the bench. So he was living on Madison Avenue. He would walk down Madison Avenue to Columbia Law School when it was located on uh, Madison and 49th Street. Uh, he went into practice with his older brother. Uh, he was tapped for, uh, uh, he was elected to the, the Supreme Court and very shortly thereafter was, was appointed to the Court of Appeals. And he stayed there until his appointment uh, to the U.S. Supreme Court by President Hoover. And that was in the 1930s. I think his state 
uh, career, his career as a state judge was probably a lot more distinguished than his career as a U.S. Supreme Court justice. Uh, he really distinguished him more in, with his decisions in state law. I don't think, I think he was unhappy relocating from New York City to Washington, D.C. He never married. He lived with his sister for many years on the Upper West Side in a brownstone on a, just off Central Park West. And he served on the bench for about seven years until his death in, I think, 1937. On the Supreme Court bench? Yeah. So, uh, unfortunately, we have to wrap up, uh, and this has been just marvelous, and thank, uh, thank you so much for this uh, uh, tour down memory lane of uh, New York monuments and New York uh, legal lions. But what is it about New York uh, that makes it uh, the, uh, the proving ground for so many great national figures? Well, I could list another 25 people who were, you know, held high government office and were New York lawyers, at, but that tradition and then because New York is the center of the legal world, of the financial world, and that's why some of the finest lawyers find themselves in New York City. But it's a tradition that you really don't see as much anymore. And maybe, you know, the, the confirmation hearings that we see today are a reason why very successful lawyers are less inclined to subject themselves to political life. Well, Cardozo was approved in the United States Senate uh, unanimously by voice vote. So, Bob Piggott, thank you so much. Thank you much very much, Jim. By. And thank you for coming by. Uh, tune in next week for more conversations. I'm Jim Zirin. Take care and all the best.